four views of Revelation and how John was able to do and able to see everything that he saw and everything that he did. Which one are you? Find out next. All right, everybody. So Revelation chapter 4. Four, we're finally out of the churches, and the, the title in the, in the Bible is The Scene in Heaven. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. We're only going to get through about maybe four to five verses. We're not going to try to take this whole chapter. Uh, you, you can't. Then We're going to take a long time through Revelation. I mean, as we get into the seals and the bowls and everything, the trumpets, uh, it's going to take a while. So first thing you have to understand, uh, Revelation chapter 3, re well, Revelation 1 through 3, was a vision that God gave John pertaining to the churches. Um, he sees he sees Jesus, and then he and then he gets this vision from Jesus about these churches. Gets the word. Revelation chapter four starts a second vision, um, and it's actually a little bit more than a vision. We'll find out. We actually, when we talk about this, John is actually in this one taken up into heaven, um, bodily, mind, physically. Uh, somehow raptured up there are things in this book that you're going to hear me say i don't understand it a whole lot um but if i believe in the rapture of the saints if i believe in the rapture of enoch if i believe in the rapture of elijah i, I can i can believe in the rapture of john I, I have no issue with it and so as we look at this we have to understand in between revelation chapter 3 and chapter 4 in my bible there is about a Man, like a quarter inch space in between the end of three and the beginning of four. That quarter inch of white paper is actually where we are living right now. When we look at the end of chapter three, John has given the, the letters to all of the churches, very real churches in the time of John. He has written these letters and he has... He has given them their, their admonition. He's given them their rebuking and all of those things. In chapter 4, we get this very future view of things to come while John is in a very present state. And we were just talking about this, Bruce and I, and this is a very hard thing to wrap your mind around. For John, it's right now. But John is transported not only to heaven, but he's transported to the future because he's going to see things after the fact, after the end of all things. And so you have to understand how God works through time and through space and through all of these things to really grasp Revelation. Please, 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 when you read Revelation, don't take everything in this book at complete face value. So John writes his letters to the churches, <clears throat> and in chapter 4 he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. That second after these things is what we're looking at that is so important here. John starts by saying, After these things, after I had written to the churches, after I had gotten all of this information, I saw a door standing open to heaven, basically. The clouds to heaven were shut. The clouds, the door to the Holy of Holies, the veil that separates God and man was let open and John was allowed to come into the private throne room of God. And he hears this voice that says, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. After what things? after the things of the churches, right? God has given all these admonitions. He's given all these suggestions to the churches. You need to go and persevere. You need to go and be in restrengthened. You need to go and do this. You need to go and do this, right, to these seven churches. Now he's looking and he's saying, after these things, after they had done these things, and after they're rebuking, and after the, the, the summary of this, I was taken up and I was shown what happened after these things. We are still living, in my opinion, because I'm gonna in a minute I'm gonna refute my own opinion, but in my opinion, in my biblical understanding, we are still living in these things. So John is seeing what happens at the end of the church age, right? At the end of the age of the churches. 
So, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. But instantly I was in the Spirit. I was taken up, caught up in the Spirit. And I was standing before the throne of heaven. Now we know that John has a body because he talks about his body in some of these different forms, in some of these different ways. He falls down, he weeps. So we know that he is in bodily form. Do we know that John's physical body wasn't left on Patmos and his spiritual body drawn out? We, I, I, I don't know that. I don't know that. I have to go back to Paul, what Paul says in the epistles when he says, whether in body form or in spirit form, I don't know. All I know is John was in heaven and he sees a throne. Every commentator that I've read, everybody that I've looked at has said it's interesting that the first thing John notices when he gets to heaven is the throne. It's amazing that the first thing he sees, the first thing his eyes lock on is the throne of God. It's what he describes first. And for us, what a beautiful thing that that is, that we know that there is a throne in a kingdom, that there is a king that sits on it. It would be one thing if it was like, you know, I got to heaven and I saw God and he was just up there pacing. Or I saw God and he was, you know, relaxed on a bed asleep. But when John says, I see a throne, it's very comforting for us that as a kingdom of heaven, as a kingdom of God, there is a king sitting on a throne. Immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, the throne was standing in heaven and the one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. Now, there are other words and other translations. Um, I'm going to make this as easy for you as, as, as can possibly be. Whenever there are stones mentioned in the Bible, do yourself a favor, look up the Greek of those stones and look at the colors of those stones. So when he says, I saw one like Jasper and one like Sardius, that really means nothing to us. You kind of go, I don't even know what Jasper and Sardius look like. But when you look up the colors, it says, I saw one. And the Jasper here, Jasper comes in a lot of different colors. But the Jasper here is this brilliant white, almost like this diamond or this crystal color. The sardius stone, carnelian, is this beautiful crimson red. And so John is contrasting. He sees these two colors coming out from the throne of heaven. And he goes, one of them is beautiful and bright and white and vibrant. And it, it, it symbolizes, there's this beautiful symbolic reflection of purity and grace and, and just honor and loveliness. And the other color is this crimson red that is this symbolic gesture of the blood of Jesus Christ, right? You can even go, go as far to say the white, the angelic white, the, the, the angelic sense of God Almighty versus the red, the blood of man, and how these two are separate but together. It, it is this beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, and it's this beautiful picture of God and man and how they come together at the throne of God. He says, I saw this throne, and there are these beautiful, radiant, vibrant beams coming from behind it in these two beautiful colors. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. So around, circling around the throne, there is this rainbow, there's this depth of color that is emerald in appearance, this green, you know, and, and, and like you can't even comprehend if it was like just different shades of green or if it was one solid, what exactly did John see? But the fact that he mentions and he says there is this rainbow that circles the throne of God. That's what I want you to notice here. Not so much the emerald in color, but the throne is surrounded by a rainbow of God. So when we talk about this, we talk about God sitting on his throne as a king. We talk about God in his holiness, in all of his majesty, that he is sitting on the throne. He is poised, and we have to understand that the grace we have comes through Christ Jesus. But in the book of Revelation, as we're going to see, the wrath of, of, of everything 
comes from the throne of God, that God is poised, ready to pour out his wrath on the sin of mankind. And as God sits on the throne with this rainbow encircled around him, that he is constantly reminded by himself that he will never again flood the earth and destroy all of mankind. God has set this parameter around his throne. He has set this emblem and this symbol around his throne that every time his wrath, that he just... He just looks at the sin of man and he is enraged at the sin of man that there is this reminder that he has put on himself that he will not yet destroy us. That there is grace and that there is mercy to be had. It's this beautiful, beautiful picture of of God basically binding himself by his own promises And by his own word to save mankind. And around the throne I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. These elders, who are they? Maybe it's me. Hopefully. Probably not. We know that they're not angels. They're clothed in white with golden crowns on their heads. This is not the dress of angels. This is the dress of of redeemed mankind, right? We've talked about this in in church. If you've watched our videos or you've been with us in person, these victor's crowns that you receive at the end of your life. And so you have those that are dressed in white. They've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They've been saved and they're clothed and they're white and they've been given the victor's crown of life. And so you look and you go, okay, so who are these men? Who are these elders that sit around the throne of God? There's 24 of them. One of the most common analogies for this, one of the most common explanations for this is that 12 of them are the heads or representatives of the tribes of Israel and that the other 12 of them are the 12 disciples, which begs an interesting question. And I've been asked this question, so I'll ask it to you, and I don't have an answer for it, but if there are 12 seats for 12 disciples, is Judas there? Did he make it to heaven and get a seat? I don't know. I mean, the son of perdition, right? The one who was chosen before time to fall away. Is he there? Is it replaced by Matthias? Is John, who is writing this letter, looking at himself seated on one of these thrones? It's a very interesting thing. One of the other things is to say um, it may not be the elders of Israel and it may not be the disciples. It may simply be 24 representatives from the church age which are seated on those thrones in first chronicles in first chronicles chapter 24 we see that as the sons of aaron came along there were found men of honor and they were divvied up into 24 positions 24 heads or representatives to govern over the people to be priests over the people that was for the age of the law so maybe god has allowed 24 Uh, representatives or chiefs or elders from the church age to be these 24 elders. Maybe, you know, it may, you get up there and it's Billy Graham and it's, you know, all of these great, you know, Spurgeon is there in in these different, these different pastors. We honestly don't know. The Bible doesn't give us any more clarity on it. It simply says later on, we talk about the 24 elders, that they simply are there for the glory of God They lay their crowns at the feet of Jesus and they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's all it gives us. We we don't know who they are, but we know their function. As Jesus talked to one of the churches about, if you will persevere and you will endure, I will allow you to reign over the nations. We understand that these 24 elders, that word elders is important, that they are given special authority by God to help rule and help oversee in heaven. So whoever they are, they are men who were found to be faithful witnesses on earth and have been given the complete privilege of helping to oversee the events of heaven. And that's, that's an amazing thing. And out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
And this is where we're going to stop. But I want to talk to you just for a second about this because this is beautiful. We see Jesus, right? John has already been introduced to Jesus Christ. He's been introduced now. He has seen not so much the form of God Almighty, God the Father, but he has seen the majesty and the Shekinah glory, right? This all-surrounding, all-surpassing glory of God Almighty. And now he has seen in this in this beautiful scene with these flashes of lightning and this rolls of thunder, and as he's standing here, standing, staring at this throne, and he sees the elders and the multitude, he's seeing all of these things. And in the midst of it, there's this lampstand with these seven lights that are lit. And this is a visual representation of the Holy Spirit. This is a visual representation that you have the throne of God Almighty seated next to Him. At the right hand of God Almighty is Jesus Christ. It never says that the Holy Spirit is seated to the left, but the Holy Spirit is there in the midst. And there's this beautiful picture that as He's standing there staring at the majestic throne of God and all of this is going on and He's hearing this roll of thunder and these flashes of lightning, that in the midst of this, there's this very calm flame that is this very calm presence, ever-present. I'm going to read to you real fast. Albert Barnes, I love Albert Barnes as, as, a, as a pastor and commentator. And he writes this about that light. He says, Perhaps there being placed before the throne in the midst of the thunder and the lightning may be designed to represent the idea that amidst all the scenes of magnificence and grandeur, all the storms and agitation and tempests, on the earth, all the political changes, all the convulsions of empire under the providence of God, all the commotions of the soul of man produced by the thunders of the law, that the Spirit of God beams calmly and serenely, shedding a steady influence over everything. Like lamps burning in the midst of lightning and thunder and voices, and all the scenes of majesty and the commotion that occur on the earth, the Spirit of God is present shedding a constant light undisturbed in his influence by all the agitations that are abroad. That's such a beautiful picture of just the steadiness of the Holy Spirit through everything else that's going on. And John sees this picture. I want to end with you really quickly. There's going to be, as we study out Revelation, I'm going to get away a little bit from doing the invitation. I always want to offer you the invitation to receive Jesus Christ, but these are going to sound a little bit more like college lectures. And I want to talk to you just a little bit for just a second about, as we go through the book of Revelation, you need to kind of set in your heart and set in your mind that there are four main views of the book of Revelation, how we understand the book and how we read the book. And it's important that you understand those four as we move forward. Because you're hearing me talk about everything in the future because I believe in this viewpoint. So as we look at this, four views of the book of Revelation. Number one is the preterist view. The preterist view says this, that everything that John wrote about was fulfilled in the Roman Empire. Everything was fulfilled around A.D. 70. That John is writing to these churches and he's talking about, when he talks about persevering through, he's talking about persevering persevering through Roman persecution. When he talks about an Antichrist, he's talking about Nero. When he talks about like everything pertains to the Roman Empire. I don't buy that because you have... We'll get there. I don't buy that. The idealist view. The idealist view is that when you read the book of Revelation, everything is symbolic. Nothing is to be taken at literal view. When it says John was taken up, he didn't. He wasn't literally taken up. That's symbolic. When it says that he stood before a throne, he didn't stand before an actual throne. That's symbolic. I can't go that route either because I look and go, there is a throne in heaven. And John makes very concrete statements that said these things have to happen. And if we read everything is symbolism and everything is metaphor. Now, not to say there's not symbols and metaphor in Revelation. There certainly are. Because John had to write about things that he had never even seen before. He's writing about locusts the size of horses that are, you know, and and you sit back and go, this dude's crazy. John is simply just trying to understand things from his time. He's seeing 
nuclear war. He's seeing the end of things. He's seeing helicopters and tanks and all these things. And he's never seen these things. They're breathing fire from their mouths. And so he's going, they're dressed like horses ready for battle. He's just, he's putting things in his perspective that he can understand. So you have to understand that. So everything being symbolic, I don't think so. The historicist view, the, the, the historical view, this one's interesting. This one might have some teeth to it. Historical view says that the book of Revelation basically is happening over and over and over again throughout all of history. That there isn't just one Antichrist. That there isn't just one group of elders. That there isn't just one tribulation. That there are multiple. That, that the Antichrist, basically that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was an Antichrist. That Nero in Rome was an Antichrist. That Hitler in Germany was an Antichrist. That all of these, and it's this very cyclical, cyclical view, instead of this linear view that this has to happen and then cha 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 it's this, it's this rotating view that these things are going to happen over and over and over again throughout history, throughout the purification of the church. Not saying I believe it, just saying that one is probably the most fun if you want to do research on it. That one's probably the most fun, and it's got, it's got the most interesting uh, little caveats and, side, and sideways. And then there is what I, I hold to, and, and what I think the majority of believers today hold to, and that's the futurist view. That from chapters 1 through 3, what John saw was right then. At chapter 4, we begin this very futuristic view of what happens after these things, that these things are yet to come. And it's a very interesting way of looking at things that John is, John is writing right now about things that have yet to come. That when John writes about a great multitude in heaven too numerous to count, that John was able to see you and I if we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That John the revelator has already seen us in heaven that he was allowed access past the the great white throne of judgment think about these things he had to have been given this full access view to be able to see the things that he saw which means that god is not bound by our space and our time and god already has seen all of these things play out and he already knows the ending of all of these things which will make your brain hurt if you think about it too much, but should give you a great, great comfort. That if God knows your name, and if it was written in the book of life before the beginning of time, that it will not be blotted out. Not because God picked you in the beginning because He loves you more than everybody else, but because He has already seen you at the end of all things worshiping and glorifying Him. Right? God's not picking favorites at the beginning. God is casting out love to those whom He already knows are faithful. When He writes to the churches and says, Be faithful, He already knows they're going to be faithful or not. But He loves them anyway. When He chose Judas, He already knew He was going to betray him, but He loved him anyway. When He created Adam, He already knew He was going to fall, but He loved him anyway. That is the book of Revelation the gospel of Jesus Christ, that through all of these things, God knows what's going to happen. And He loves us anyway. So as we journey through this, research those four views, preterist, idealist, histor historicist, and futurist. Figure out which one you believe to be true. And then we'll discuss them a little bit more. And as we get through this book, you're just going to be amazed at what John sees, and you're going to be amazed at how good and how wonderful and how to use a word that we use way too often, how amazing God is. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. God, I know this has been kind of a, a disheveled and all over the place kind of message, but Lord, I just pray that you would help us to understand where we are in the timeline of Scripture, where we are in the timeline of human events and of God's events. And Father, I just pray that you would just give us a peace as those saved through Jesus Christ, Father, that these events that are coming, while they are wild and they are unimaginable, Father, that we don't have to worry about. Them. Father, that there is a reason 
that you give us peace and comfort through these times and through this book is because we are saved. And saved not only from our lives, but saved from the persecution, from the tribulation that is coming on this earth. And Father, we just pray that you would just bless us in this reading. Father, we just pray that as our hearts are churned up and are troubled by the things going on in the world, Father, that this would give us a peace. That even though the thundering and the lightning and all of these things are going on around us, that there is this flame that sits steady and steadfast in heaven. The Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to shine light on us. Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in your holy and magnificent name we pray. Amen.